we distinguish what is real by what seems to be more permanent than the movement of thought. I can be in this room right now and imagine like there being like, let's say a, a giant apple just floating in the room. I can imagine a giant apple floating in the room, but that apple is not physically here. We say uh, it's in the domain of imagination. It is imagined. But what is being imagined is being is is a sort of flame that is sparked from using a reality like like how the caveman used sticks and stones to make fire by allowing different parts of reality to engage one another the introduction towards the unknown becomes your imagination. Your imagination is the intermediary between the known and the unknown. Uh, archetypes can be said to be um, behind the scene of all phenomena imagined. They are, they are kind of like, the just like how we use color, you know, different colors to make sense of different things. Similarly, it's as if we are using different archetypes to make sense of the colors of imagination, of how the imagination approaches or appears. For me, it's one of those things where you got to first see the position. You got to see what you're given. So just like an exam, you see what's given and then you proceed. So similarly, with any sort of enlightened, uh, enlightening activity or any sort of mystical practice, one wants to in some sense see how the self is given by nature to the world. So in some sense, imagine you're an observer of a process of nature and you are observing this process of nature to such a degree where you, where you feel you are this process of nature. That means when, you, when we take a filter of the natural, the unnatural, imagination falls, is, is bound by those uh, restrictions as well. Natural imagination, unnatural imagination. Things you consciously imagine, things that project in your imagination. As if you have casted some, some uh, actors in your play, imagine, in, in, in your theater performance or your movie or whatever. And some actors you have not casted, but they are there. So similarly, some, some thoughts you consciously uh, are, are uh, responsible for, but a lot of thoughts in your experience, I find uh, the majority of unknown thoughts compared to known thoughts is more. My knowledge has to be imposed. It's something like, just like how you open a book and then the world of the words is visible. Similarly, my consciousness has to, in some sense, <coughs> open the world to a shape of itself in order to allow that shape to expand and evolve. So one can say it's as if our bodies were destined to have thoughts and our thoughts were destined to wonder about our bodies. And so based on the dimensions we perceive of what we are, the given dimensions, then you begin to see what can be done. Life is not just a mechanical process. That is the problem uh, in some sense that science has to confront in the sense that it, it has a mechanical approach. That means the illogical uh, by the inquisition is in some sense uh, just like the Inquisition is, is banned. And so this is the thing. We have to create a culture of uh, not just external explorers, but internal explorers. Half of the species should be running about progressing external explorations. Half of the species should be focused about internal maintenance. So what that means is imagine like the TV, anime TV series Attack on Titan. All of humanity inside the walls uh, is like in, in this kind of, these giant walls are protecting humanity from these chaotic giants, okay, in that anime show. So similarly, you have to administer uh, what is within the kingdom and what is outside the kingdom. And at times, what is within the kingdom from your own domain of reality, solutions must emerge to problems outside of your inner life, okay? So what that means is that your mind no longer becomes just a random viewer. It becomes a, a servant of, of an intellectual command to explore. Authentic exploration is the stairway to heaven. And authentic exploration has to do with, with an ability to be content. Because some, most people right now functioning in society 
in order to be part of society, they have to deny certain aspects of who they are, or they have to accept certain aspects of who they are. You see, as if when the world judges you, what can you say? Each, each, each uh, word from from your mouth becomes, you know, enters different ears. Different different worlds get generated from the same sentence by different people hearing. So how reality meets imagination is to kind of look at the borders of reality. The borders of reality are your conscious knowledge. Your conscious knowledge is being kept by the unconscious way that memory is here. That means if I ask you, what are you? You know, you can, like the simple answer is, I'm just like, I'm just this person. I'm just like this body. You know, I'm just this. When I look in the mirror, I only see a body. I don't see a mind on a table, you know? And so that's the thing, that a part of our intelligence is designed to be what it observes, and a part of our intelligence is designed to be the observer. And the observer is beyond the intelligence. So your mind, by definition, is beyond your body. Okay? And your, in, in quotations, uh, soul is beyond your mind. Which means, just like how you, you, you can't just use matter to explain... Um, psychology, you know, psychology has to also do with the inner presence of the being. The inner presence of the being is, is like out in front of your eyes, you're made of cells. Behind your eyes, you're made of thoughts. Okay? These thoughts are how the attention of just this present observer within you is still on an idea. So a very interesting way of explaining this is that sometimes when I go, emotions arise in me. It, it's not just emotion. Like if when you get angry, it's not just anger is occurring. What's happening is an internal resistance, a sort of violation of the alignment of the inner reality with the outer reality. So the, either the inner reality justifies its correct or the outer reality justifies its correct, you know? Trust me, if everybody had access to, if, if like, um, there's this TV show I'm very fond of, uh, Black Mirror. And in Black Mirror, in the third episode, uh, it's this situation where people have this technology, this device that is, their eyes are recording everything and they can access it, okay? So if the guy was in a business meeting, he can, he can in some sense, in the taxi, on the taxi ride home, kind of like look at the business meeting over and over again as if it's recorded in, in some sort of digital sight through their eyes, so, uh, digital sensor through their eyes. And so, so what occurs is that The same way that a person in that TV show was able to technologically access their memories in incredible stillness and silence, you're, you, you become a watcher of not just physical phenomena, but subtler phenomena, subjective phenomena. You kind of get access to your subtler planes. When you get access to your subtler planes, it's a relationship. So you got to enter the most crucial thing of any person stepping through a stargate is how they're going to in some sense, allow the world to stand in their sight. There have been times that my inner reality has pulled me, like has directed my day more than my outer reality. There has been, a, there has been days where the outer reality purely was the director. That means on, on that day, I had no need for my imagination. I was so involved and engaged with activities that just living physical reality was kind of like being your imagination, you know? There, there was a very unique uh, poet named Moana Rumi who, who said, be living poetry. That means somebody asked him how to write poetry and the guy was like, you're not here to write poetry. Be living poetry. Free the inner experience beyond the definitions of the outer realm. Once you get to this freedom, this freedom is empty, ladies and gentlemen. It is empty of context. It is the pure witnessing of the content, concept. What that means is, um, a person standing in a forest, we can say the person can be the concept and the forest is sort of the context, okay? Now, when our attention goes on the context, the individual becomes so small that it becomes irrelevant. When we look at the stars and when we read about galaxies and black holes, we're like, man is an ant. 
man is an ant under a pebble. That's what uh, astro uh, kind of astronomy, astrophysics, and just various ways of looking at the stars kind of taught me. It taught me that in some sense the macrocosm makes the individual will. It's as if you know what's written your destiny, how the whole world moves. Just like how your attention dictates your personality, manifest reality is dictated by in some sense. I find this universe is the whole, is the expression of the personality of God. What that means is emptiness uh, has, is using a matter, consciousness is using matter uh, as a mirror. But it's a sort of escapism. You see, I, the biggest thing I thought about our civilization, often I, I find myself in moments where I forget about myself and I forget about everybody and my, I just kind of meditate. No, I don't want to say meditate, but like concentrate. I concentrate on how I feel the world I've perceived so far internally will hold. So imagine like before you go to work in the morning, you're wondering what your work out, uh, your work in the whole day is going to be like, you know? So the mind can move faster than the body. And because it moves faster than the body, the body finds itself within a conscious rhythm or a conscious directive. That means a lot of natural forces, it's just as if they, like they were, there are commands of a universal will, okay? For me, religion was mind-blowing back in the day. I'm pretty sure the reason religion has a very big following because it was such a bizarre idea to the normality of the time that people could not comprehend that the world was created. Do you see? It was a new idea. Everybody started off, started off before we learned language. Everybody, they, all atheists can, you know, uh, take a, um, you know, uh, have a sigh of relief in some sense. Because before we learned language, we had no beliefs. We created our beliefs. Just like how we have designed our buildings, we have designed the way our mind moves. Okay? It, so a part of part of the experience of the moment is has to do with how reality embraces imagination, but part of how uh, uh, imagination also embraces reality. You cannot you cannot just enter a tunnel, you know, look at one end of a tunnel, and not wonder about the other end. That's what the problems in our life kind of appear. There are tunnels we must confront and go through, and in the immediate and direct confrontation of the setting, data jumps at you. When data jumps at you, that means you have learned to trust your moment. When you trust something, intelligence can flow. Without trust, intelligence can't flow, you know? If, if the being goes on, imagine like an X Factor kind of like American Idol kind of thing, right? The guy's gone on stage. If he has 0% trust in how his mind is going to make his body and voice move or something, like it's one of those things where faith is religion does not own faith but faith is required in religious practice when we look at secular practice secular practice requires faith but not in a blind ceremonial way requires faith as a sort of acceptance of the laws of nature. Any person who's like, oh, okay, when I throw something, something I think gravity, like it, it's faith that kind of makes you feel you know the gravity of different situations. And what is faith? Faith is just f having your attention on an internal image that still f finds itself valid in external movement. There's two dimensions of you. We are walking in two worlds and not just because we have two brain hemispheres. We're walking in two worlds because there's two directions universal phenomena can go. It can either continue and evolve and grow, it can move towards the light, or it can stay in the shade. Life has to do mainly with your ability of how clearly you're functioning in the present moment rather than how much you know. All knowledge is, is like tools. They're kind of tools. We, we are, in some sense, still hunter-gatherers, but we're not hunting 
for objective phenomena anymore. We're hunting for subjective phenomena. We are trying to, in some sense, uh, conquer unknown territory in our mind. And the mind is uncharted territory because it is, it, the mind is the most unique thing. It is what is generating all language, yet no language can define it. There is something be, within you that is undefinable and in some sense unspeakable. It is the awareness of speech. When I give these talks, uh, at the same time, a part of me is like, also is comfortable with the silence, is also comfortable with meaning suddenly leaving. Because that's what death would be. Death would, in some sense, be a, 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 a kind of uh, 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 emptiness of meaning. When a person sees they're going to die, they eventually they stop caring. They, they stop lying to themselves. Okay? This is why I feel every person, before they die, they become an honest man. Their inner reality, all the subjective lies and illusions have to crumble. Because fear commands attention of the honest woman, you know? So for me, if we are natural beings, <clears throat> and if there is, at the same time as there is an objective component to the moment's existence, there is a subjective component to the moment's existence, when we study that subjectivity, we find that tension that is claiming it is free and it is a will. It is a sort of uh, intention that is unlimited. And on a, a limitless intention, that's what free will is. So, something that is free to be. Okay? Now, we, the moment we, we, we evolved into the subjective realm or remembered it in some sense, The tool cannot be the user. The technology cannot be the truth. That means you holding a tool, imagine you hold a wrench in your hand, but you suddenly forget the wrench is not a part of your hand. You know? <laughs> so what occurs is that you, feel, you will accept an artificial uh, reality or, uh, as part of your truth. You will accept something that is not a part of you as part of you, and when when that occurs, there, uh, if that part of if there is a hollowness to your uh, orig original existence, uh, then your original existence has not been found. People are born twice, and they also die twice. The externality first is born then the conscious internal viewer, in some sense, takes shape. That means your name is like your second self. It's like a mask you wear on your face, which you feel is you. A mask that is kept by the pillars of memory, that has been designed by uh, how the moment is able to generate. Because I got this very profound revelation. Uh, I, I feel society is kind of designed to make us think about our future. When we think about our future, we come into the conclusion that there is a scarcity at work. That means society cannot make ev satisfy everybody at once. This scarcity makes us go on our own road. So most of the time, people are lone travelers. They're travelers in their own realm, in their own universe. When they come to gatherings or places where others are, that is when they have to be. A they will come into novelty. This is why we kind of get bored when we're alone too much. <laughs> because we, we, we have seen how our mind has made the world, but we have not yet seen how the minds of others influence how our mind can be made. So pretty much when four people sit at a table and speak, you know, when in, in the school of Athens, many great philosophers debated, what occurred was many worlds integrating. And the integration of the realms made, meant the challenging of ideas. That means the concept of winning, winning made us pay attention to our individualism. 
However, the concept of winning has reached its limit when winning in nowadays means others losing. Winning can only be said when, imagine you win. Imagine right now you succeed in everything you do and you become the richest, most successful, healthiest person on this planet. You will look at your species and you'll be like, what the fuck? Like all these people are malnutrition. Uh, there's a mal malnutrition both subjectively and objectively. So many people are living in ways where if they had the right thought and view, they could live better. At the same time, so many people are living in ways that regardless of the thoughts they have, the objectivity is too intense. That means, I, you know why they would say in some sense uh, the Buddha was a blessed being? In, Bu in Buddhism, uh, the Buddha was blessed because B the Buddha was known to say that when uh, somebody born in a rich family has good karma. Why? Why did he say that? How is it good karma to be, in, in, to, to be born in a palace? It is good karma because your attention during your lifetime mainly goes to how your mind is composed, not how your body is composed. When survival is rough, you don't pay attention to your mind. You become just an embodied creature of just the circumstance of the ecosystem. You know, so I was walking in nature, and uh, I remember kind of I saw like a squirrel or like something like a bird, like like staring at me. It was like I walked, I was walking in a park, and I noticed wildlife. Noticed I was in the proximity of the area, you know. And for a second, when I saw that bird, this is um, because this talk is about imagination uh, and reality and how they dance in some sense or how their dance uh, is done. Uh, I was walking in nature, I saw an animal, and the way that animal was staring at me suddenly made my imagination fill space, fill the vacuum behind the objective phenomena being witnessed. And internally, I just got a, a, I, I, I was like playfully looking through the eyes of the squirrel, but through another energetic dimension, through another way energy uh, takes shape. <clears throat> The energy of this universe is kind of like a central point where many degrees, many dimensions are arising. They arise in relationship to, to the will, as if there was, a, there was a container and it's being filled with life intelligence. Okay, it can, the universe is something like that. It's a sort of um, uh, emptiness is the container and experience is what is filling this container of existence. Oh, uh, because emptiness exists, guys. Without emptiness, where is the world? How can the world be full? So as I was walking, what I kind of playfully, my mind kind of, in some sense, brought about in that moment, what arose from my imagination behind the perceived reality, was that I saw as if the squirrel was not seeing a person, the squirrel was seeing a creature where as if there are, we think our brains, we think our minds are separate, but there are lines, conscious lines, like believe it or not, invisible strings that are ener they're energetic. Like if, 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 they, if they were to be seen, they kind of look at a, like a, how a light beam would, but not, not restricted to just a straight format. It has curvature. So what I mean by that is, uh, you can, whether you want to have an electromagnetic perception on this or you want to have an abstract kind of uh, metaphysical perception on this, there is a sort of interconnectivity going on once the individual totally sees that it is an individual. Once a lifetime of consciousness has been achieved, then arises a lifetime where unconsciousness moves consciousness. So you are in the known dimension, you know, and then your intelligence will go function in unknown dimension. Okay, and fear belongs to the box that it was created in. There is a sort of linguistic simulation. Don't think the world is what you think it is. That's what I'm saying. So where are we left if we don't trust, if not, not that if we don't trust our thoughts, but let's say we went to the depth of thought and we saw the thought was empty. So what is filling life with meaning? 
And objectively, the light of the sun fills our life with meaning. But subjectively, it is the opportunity and emptiness for sight to be that fills it. It's a recognition. There's a, a, at the edge of your memory, you begin to see how nature doesn't separate between reality and imagination. It just functions. So I was like, if everything in this universe is a natural phenomenon, how could I have unnatural thoughts? How could I get convinced that I am just a thought of myself? If the thought of myself, primarily, everything it is, is moving by nature. So pretty much we're saying free will is an illusion if nature is moving everything. And free will is only an illusion if the free will is separate from nature. If the free will context is given to, to the individual before the individual is accepted to be a natural phenomenon. There was a man named Aldous Huxley. He said, there are things known and things unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. These doors of the perception, I hope that if you're listening to my talk, you don't get, mar like there's a, ma magic is <clears throat> marketing truth. Everything, every idea is marketing truth. But at the same time, esoteric mysticism has a very unique thing. E esoteric communities exist as a natural requirement for the species mind to begin, uh, let me tell you what esoteric communities are doing. They feel they're like communicating with a parallel dimension of entities that are simultaneously in this world. You know? <clears throat> you see, I, ca I consider logic and rationality to not be what will find truth, but to be the flashlight that uh, uh, in some sense brightens the dark forest of the mind. As you explore how thoughts are being you, how your emotions arises, and how, how, how much thoughts bring emotion, and how much emotions bring thought. Thoughts begin to bring an emotion when they actually touch your uh, core memory. They're just like your skeleton, your memory of this world has a sort of uh, abstract skeletal structure, but its skeletal structure is not made with like, uh, like bone, like how your body is. The skeleton of your mind is made of language that has been accepted to be real. You have pretty much made objects by putting names on them. Okay, so your memories, uh, and everybody's different. A person's memory can be something where Your memory can be a dream. If the future never existed. For me right now, if, if somebody was to ask me the question, who are you? Just as like imagine an extraterrestrial landed and wanted to know like came down to earth, came to our level of speech, and suddenly this extraterrestrial, let's say, you know, in this thought experiment, asked a human being, hey, human being, what are you? Explain. And if in our explanation, we do not include an integrative presence of our intelligence, How would I say? We are creatures of mind and matter. We matter as much as our minds can perceive the matter. We are minds as much as matter is dynamic. When life happens in front of me, I, I get tears of joy. <laughs> I get tears of joy because I see a sort of divinity at work, how energy leads a phenomena to work, the laws of nature are divine. 
And believe it or not, scientists acknowledge this, but they acknowledge it through an intellectual pursuit, as if the binoc um, the telescope they're looking at truth with is one where you cannot deny the te telescope's reality. So the hardest thing for our species, if, if truth is beyond our eyes and we can't accept it. And religion was a sort of contentment. Religion gave the responsibility to an identity of the universe. I, I, when I look at religion, I see an incredible design of literature. I see an architecture. I see either a linguistic uh, uniqueness, as if why these ideas entering the mind of the reader. The more the ratio of unknown phenomena is more in your moment, the more imagination is active. The more you think you know, the less you're creative. Because the more you, you have filtered the world, you have made the laws of nature so solid that they can't see things any other way. That is, that is my problem with the mainstream. I'm kind of looking at our species and being like, what is this incredible idea worship going on? People, it's, it's as if before our people were fighting, now I believe some people are fighting one another. One group comes and tells another group, disbelieve this, this the shit you're believing, you know? And, you know, the other group shouts at the other group and says, believe the shit you're disbelieving, you know? And so it's one of those things where it's, it's, we are all pointing at the stars but not seeing the stars. Because if we did, we would no longer fight. It's too big. Nobody can win. There's only one winner in existence, and the, that, the name of that winner is time. Time lives. And time is so is such a winner that all those people in the future who are going to technologically try to keep themselves immortal are going to see time is way ahead of them in succession. That means time will has made the way nature is designed. If you stay in this world too long, it's like waiting at the bus a bus stop for too long. Do you see? It's like you're not you're not meant to be in the bus stop. That's why many mystic, true, true natural mystics back in the day, if you ask them what life is, it, for them, it wasn't a school. It wasn't an education. It, for them, it was a sort of journey. It was, it, it, it was the, the processes of nature became to the mystic a sort of uh, roller coaster of, of experiential advancement. We can't tell people a too happy story of life because then they will become irresponsible. We can't tell them too tragic of a story of life because then they, in some sense, become uh, afraid and they also become irresponsible. You know, when, when an animal is pushed to a corner, you know, it will, it will fight back. When a human being is pushed to its edge, it will become violent. So the, all, or I could tell you right now, let me tell you why violence exists. Because so many people feel they are not being seen by the world that has brought them forth. They're not being acknowledged. The, great, the biggest reason why insanity occurs in civilization, violence and inefficiency occurs in civilization, is because people don't recognize that Humanity must be preserved. Humanity must be kept. Every person, their, what their day is, is not just mediocre tasks. Their day is moment creation. You are creating every moment of your existence by going through it. Okay? Your mind does it automatically. A lot of uh, ideas come to you because your mind is doing things that if you were to see, then there would be no surprise. The division, the veil of the whale of thoughts, as many mystics, even Carl Jung caught on to this. Carl Jung uh, noticed the difference. He, know, he recognized archetypes and their subconscious and unconscious roots. And how the person's personality is very easy. You can see, I, I, because the, I feel because our intelligence works with design, everything can have a design. You know, even people have, 
they call it theosophy. It's the relationship with another world and its accurate design. And the cool thing is the human being is not in one state. That means, what, let's say you tell someone, are you a, somebody comes and tells you they're a philosopher, you know? You know, and a true philosopher would reject even the idea of being a philosopher. Do you know how many philosophers, 100% true philosophers, have debated whether they're philosophers or not? <laughs> because the philosophical mind allows doubt to become a, cannibal, cater, a, a catapult into the exploration of the unknown. Philosophers see more of the world. That is why they give themselves more freedom to explore it subjectively. Life is not just contained in one story. But for the believer, you have it's as if you don't care about <clears throat> intellect and for good reason. Because you, you, you care about the ultimate destination of your intelligence and what you are in the moment is not just your intellect. Pretty much we are picking and choosing how we are being who we are in nature. Either you see nature chooses for you or you choose for nature. That's pretty much what we're oscillating between. When you sleep, guess what? You know, your fall nature is, 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 is protecting, is, is moving you, is, 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 is being you in that sense, you know? But when you wake up suddenly, whoa, the free will has its eyes open again and it has to go throughout the day. And if you give an attribute to your free will, you will feel like the same person every day, or you can be playful. Gandhi was very, his mind, Gandhi's mind was, was incredibly open. Because he, yeah, he has this statement, he has this quote where he says something like, uh, every day I go to sleep, I die. And every day I wake up, I'm a new being. So Gandhi had this relationship, which was incredible, because he was wise. He didn't uh, hold on to the past of the previous day. He was a new being every day, so his energy was no longer limited. You see? Sometimes uh, enlightenment is about self-maintenance and kind of realizing self-maintenance is self-awareness and it's pretty much about all about how awareness is maintaining the idea of self. And when you pay attention to the idea of yourself, it's changing all the time. So reality and imagination are actually just the same phenomena occurring for a sight in an empty space, okay? both of them, but they become real and imaginary because reality has a sort of acceptance of a subjective position. Reality is the visible universe. Imagination is the invisible. And where is the invisible? In the visible. Invisibility. So it's very important. Pay attention to the dualities that are dictating your For me, I'm going to say something very profound because Martin Luther King, I heard some of his speeches. He, he was an incredible speaker because he had attained an ability to see exactly what's going on and realizing that the solution was an inner change of behavior. As if Martin Luther King was so smart that he came and said the future possibility, okay, to a people who could not see that future possibility. Sometimes you get the solution, but it's not enough. The world needs to see it. It's as if like somebody had a playful conversation with a Buddhist about uh, all these programmers, these incredible programmers in Silicon Valley about what their future incarnation will be. And the Buddhist told them they were, they're all going to be robots. The Buddhist told the scientists that all the people in Silicon Valley who are just programming are going to be robots because you cannot create something and not want to see it go through. It's like, uh, you tell me. You, you know, it's like a parent who uh, suddenly has brought forth a child, a human being, has arisen and has woken up to the world from them. And now you want to see where that child goes. 
You see how that child lives. Is it safe? Is it not safe? Does it know what it is? Does it not know what it is? You know? <clears throat> what we all have in common is that our minds seem, seem to be formless. You know? That means if you speak to me right now and, and I tell you where your word's coming from, do you see? You say, you can say just the brains and neurons, bro. I mean, like, you can say that, but where is the awareness of it coming from? Do you see? Like, like this is what I'm saying. Sometimes it's like objectivity brought forth subjectivity, but subjectivity became the whole moment where objectivity was in, so the whole moment became suddenly all of objectivity. Think of how complex a dance is. Now think of that same complexity of a dance to also be in, in, in one's inner exploration of their reality. That means reality is what's in front of your eyes and we consider what is behind your eyes to be imagination. But what, what is behind your eyes is the seer, is the seer of thought. So I'm telling you, your intelligence uh, advances, activates, uh, your true intelligence, true natural intelligence activates when you suddenly see you're not a thought and you're not your emotions. You're a moment of being where phenomena is constantly changing within it. Then, then you, 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 you become, this, it's very funny, it's like, it's like all those people who it's kind of like realizing um, your future self is who you are right now. So when reality meets imagination, either it has to give into imagination or in some sense, uh, reality has to conquer imagination. So whenever a being goes through an experience, they have to choose how they're going to interpret the unknown influences to their moment of being. And I'll tell you, the biggest cause of violence is not because the person is a bad or evil or messed up being. It's because the person has a box over their head. That's the biggest cause of violence. They, they, their awareness has not perceived a better way, a more intelligent way you can exist. And there is always a more intelligent way the moment can exist. When Salvador Dali, this great, great you know, surreal painter, uh, painter, you know what he said? He said, don't fear perfection, you'll never reach it. As if he tried to reach the mastery, the edge of his art, <clears throat> and he began to realize your perfection is based on your knowledge, but after you have uh, reached the edge of your knowledge, you begin to see your there is an unknown perfection. The mysteries, there's a sort of iridescent mystery to the world that, that gives it the, 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 the allure of a, of, of a perfect rhythm, of a perfect movement. So we are, uh, in the subtitle, I've, I've said Conscious Rhythms. This is a, a idea I've kind of created. I felt these two words have never in some sense been put together because human beings in some sense, or maybe it, have, it has, but I, the, not perhaps in the way I see it. Uh, I, I, I think of ourselves as conscious rhythms. We are oscillating between known unknown, consciousness unconsciousness. Every time we blink, our visual senses go and in some sense, the whole mind is like, whoa, where'd the world go? You know? <laughs> so we're also like we're, we're constantly getting bombarded uh, by uh, um, the unknown because our knowledge is living in the unknown. That's the best way to say it. Our knowledge has been created in an unknown universe. So either its roots are from the unknown, so that you'll never know truth because it's it's way so much unknown for the human mind's containment. Or in some sense, your own intelligence opens a new avenue. This is why there is no point of believing. 
too much. You know, you can believe, you can say, I believe this, you know, the Toronto Raptors will win, you know, and they're winning. Yeah, you know, it's my belief that's... <laughs> Sometimes when I speak, uh, my words don't appear like words to me. It's like the architecture manifesting in a time-lapse video in a city. From emptiness structure, uh, it, it steps out of emptiness in conscious attention. That consciousness is defined by what it sees. That means if you put a kid, a young kid, in a bad environment, that consciousness will know the bad first. So most of its life, it's going to wonder what the good's going to be like. And if you put someone in a good consciousness, you know, they're going to constantly stay good and go, go to this, but they will eventually wonder how the other half lives. And that's very important, that our humanity doesn't get forgotten due to class distinction. Our recognition that regardless of what we are, how we are, where we are in some sense we're all in in on one pla on on a rock in the middle of empty space okay that's our true condition uh diogenes was asked by a citizen diogenes is a i believe greek philosopher ancient greek philosopher and so diogenes says uh somebody comes to diogenes and he was a crazy he was the next level person i think he was one of the most he, I, I give him the position of being the most badass philosopher in history because like he would get a lantern in the middle of the day and run around the market as if he's looking for someone. And people would be like, Diogenes, why do you have a lantern? What are you looking for? You know? And Diogenes would suddenly come to that crowd and say, I'm looking for an honest man. He was an incredible cynic, you know? He, he, had, he, was, he was existing in a higher dimension of intelligence. That's why his, his expression was cynical. Sometimes you say people who uh, anytime humor enters your life, you're being a very profound multidimensional being in that moment. Multi multidimensionality is a state, by the way. It's a state of being. It's a state of being where intelligence uh, segments itself to create an unknown world for the known intelligence. When people forget who they are, the civilization begins cracking and parts of it, like an iceberg, begin fading. Whatever human beings' attention does not go on is lost to the unknown. So the responsibility of any living being in 2019 is to stare very deeply into the origin of history and wonder what was the motivation of all our ancestry. And then from the other end, you must also be able to gaze at the future. You must look at what is here and how it is moving. And you have to see what kind of ways we have to, in some sense, shield, shield the um, eyes of future generations from the mistakes of the past so they don't mess up again. We have to lie to the future so it doesn't fall into the fucked up past, pretty much. Fucked up past patterns. Excuse my language. Emotions arise from the simultaneous awareness, subtler awareness of another moment. If you become emotional, uh, you, any person who's ever been emotional, their memory, a unique thing has been occurring with their memory in that moment. Emotions are like 
how you were existed in another memory and your consciousness can observe between how you were back then and how you are now, it suddenly gets emotional. It begins to see the journey of people's inner values through the decisions and the actions that their free will directs. Their free will is in some sense nature, but it is nature's permission to be. So for me, this is going to sound a bit ridiculous, guys, and I feel like some people are going to be like, what? <laughs> but um, I see ourself, uh, a humanity, as a young species. So I see every person like a child. Like, like I see their inner child. Their inner child is who they are when they're super relaxed. The honest self is the inner child. It's, that's where your conscious comes from, from a reference point where you were in alignment with the world, not resisting it. For how long do we want to have wars? Like seriously. It's like you can say somebody declared, one nation in the future declared war because its citizens were becoming so fat that they needed exercise. <laughs> like war is so meaningless. Shooting metal at fast speeds with one another is meaningless. And politics, some people look at politics and they're like, man, it's, it's chaotic, it is horrific, but at the same time, it is corrupt, but at the same time, would they wish politics never existed or not? Would we have wished our problem? Uh, can you um, blame history for how it occurred? The same way we forgive history by accepting it is the same way the sinner finds solace, finds peace. I have learned to play with thoughts by realizing I'm not a thought. And I realized that I'm not a thought because I stopped containing every moment. I stopped having an expectation uh, on the moment. And I was, kind of sat there like a, like a sort of, you know, a psychologist of my own mind. And I tried to study and see how my karma throughout the day changed based on the shift of my inner view. How as ideas moved and as my beliefs in some sense were like leaves of a tree changing throughout the seasons. When I use the term conscious rhythms, I came to the conclusion of that, that the speed of evolution, like as if let's say human beings were a seed planted in the soil of this earth. Now this seed eventually, it grew. It grew to such a point that it, how can I tell you, like, Our awareness to our mortality was the evidence for our evolution. We must build a civilization that people wake up and they're like, I can't wait to get to work. Not that, oh shit, I gotta go to work. No. We, that's the kind of civilization we need to build. When your work has to energize you throughout the day or it's uh, inefficient work. Because if you're not at your full energy, then what kind of work are you doing? You know, you're doing like low level energy work. And to, to, to do any sort of performance without full effort is a mistake. That means the easiest way to step out of misfortune is to start uh, uh, building your fortune. And how you build your fortune by honoring a vision. Life is built with the honor of a vision. I'm telling you, it's a vision of the whole thing. Every person has their own vision. This vision is how they see themselves to be who they are. We don't have to just live objective lives. Now subjectivity is becoming important or has been important, but now we're moving beyond, we're evolving beyond the languages that define our world. And Mr. Whippen is saying, are we ready? How can we be more ready? 
how can we uh, see the probabilities of the desti des destinations of Earth? Like, for example, imagine in the future, like this would, this would be a good sci-fi story, you know? <laughs> fictional story. Imagine in a future, one child is born, that this child does such incredible things, okay, that all human beings suddenly choose this child to be their command. This child seems to, in the future, that's going to be born, seems to know the pro the way how to handle all the problems of the world. So all people, imagine now this one child, and let's say this is after world. Uh, how can I say after a sort of there's no not no longer militaristic war, you know. This child will immediately look at the species and say the first thing is our news should be all the probabilities of how civilization is advancing forward. So I, I, the first thing this commander might do is look at humanity and being like, holy shit, educational system, give, your hardest, uh, give the hardest and most challenging problems of today's modern society to children. Do not treat children like children. Allow their minds to leap eons ahead. And so this is going to make children be like, holy shit, when I'm in school, I'm, I'm at least tackling. I'm tackling the problem that humanity has. And children start off from a realm of, of pure imagination, as if reality doesn't have to be a sort of fixed story for them. right? And eventually, before it becomes a fixed story, there's a lot of creative momentum. That means you can, you know how they say children say the darnest thing? A person made a TV show out of the uniqueness of how children think. But clarity is more important than anything. So the eyes of the species need to open to a sort of responsive level of responsibility where the being itself awareness has been acknowledged as a universal process, not just a, a social, cultural, ideological, belief-based kind of process, not just an emotion-based process. Look at life clearly. Find the mirror that will show you your mind is, is itself. Truth is asking the question, where is truth? That's the, that's the, um, the approval of the mystical quest. The speed of evolu evolu as evolution accelerated, it became conscious. And so it evolved into rhythms. And consciousness is a story rhythmically kept based on the being's energy levels and based on the being's, uh, the being's wakefulness. That means it's, I found it hilarious. I remember I was just like on the bus and just like I wasn't, I was just laughing to myself just internally. I, I was just like incredibly laughing to myself internally, you know, on the bus, like, <laughs> uh, because I, I suddenly realized, oh my God, when I sleep, I dream. And when I'm awake, I'm trying, I'm chasing my dreams. What is this? We dream when we're awake. We dream when we're asleep. And how, and the dream of our waking state is the future, the future we want, but the dream of our sleep is, is the direct moment. That means our, uh, our mind is attempting. It's like your mind is so engaged with world creation all the time in its waking state that when you sleep, there is like residue, echo, there's echoes of, the, of these intelligent patterns of uh, uh, world creation. The mind has in some sense uh, kind of gone through, through the day. Each day, at the end of the day, when you come home, just notice your energy level. If you're tired, if you feel your, your whole energy is left, you have done work that you didn't care about. But when you come home and you're energetic, you have done work that you care about. So energy has to do with how much you care for life. The greatness of your health has to do with how much you care for life. How much you, you, you see the living. Not, not a lot of people see life. That's why it's so easy to hurt them. They, they just start off in their own worlds. They're just in their own bubble. You know? The angry man cannot be convinced 
because he is too convinced by his inner world. He, the angry person thinks what he sees is the only right thing. The violent the person thinks the only thing he sees is the only values there are in the moment. They don't realize. They don't realize that there are other eyes looking at the moment in different values. And you must care. You must care for the sight of your species. That means the eyes of our species is opening. Okay, so children are being born and anything violent or resistant done to these children in the future, the ch our, ch our ch uh, great, 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 great grandchildren, you know? I'm saying civilization must be built that regardless of any being entering the surface and wanting to enter the human tribe, will recognize that human beings have valued the freedom of their mind as much as the freedom of their body. The, the, the enslavement on an outer level has been kind of, uh, has we have made incredible strides. Many important people in history have in some sense got rid of cultural confusions and in some sense we don't have objective slavery as much as we used to. You know, let's say like set, like a thousand years, like a eight hundred years ago or something. You know, or even much deeper, even like to the level of the ancient Egyptians, pharaohs, and whatnot. So, so let's say I'm. So, what I'm saying is that slavery has been eradicated as much as possible successfully, uh, um, and now in 2019, a more people can experience a free world, a free lifetime. A lifetime where they can walk undisturbed at the same time and bask in the glory of their species, you know. So we have, uh, so we have made incredible strides towards outer uh, freedom and getting rid of outer external enslavement. However, how much have we made strides to get rid of inner enslavement? And inner enslavement is not just you having to. Uh, 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 run to, to, to a room of thought, okay? Your freedom depends on how much you have experienced freedom. And the power of the mind is that it can generate subtle experiences. You can learn from your imagination as much as you can learn from your reality. So does that mean your imagination does not exist if you can learn from it, if your consciousness in the moment can be influenced and directed and shifted by it? Does that mean our imagination doesn't exist? It means it exists, but it exists in such a subtle way where it has to do more with our subjective inner existence rather than an outer evident manner of display. You know? It's like you go tell you go tell the scientist who wants evidence for everything, you know? And I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. You know, I I I, I, I was a kid who kind of studied mechanical engineering for some years. You see? Uh, academically, even though I didn't finish, <laughs> uh, I, I changed, uh, life took me a different direction. But I'm telling you, I have an incredible respect for science. I, 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 have seen, I can't deny what it has done. It's mighty. But if you want to see evidence, and if somebody comes and asks you, it's like, um, some, imagine somebody comes to a scientist and says, you're out of your mind. And the scientist is like, I'm not out of my mind. You're out of your mind. And then you tell the scientist, if you're not out of your mind, Okay, then prove it to me. Bring, give me evidence. Br bring your mind in front of me so I can measure it, so I can know that your mind is here and you're not out of your mind. The scientists will look at that person and being like, shenanigans, bizarre, you know? And the reason is, is because uh, all our facts are hovering again in the unknown. They, they are surrounded by the unproven. Our evidence is hovering in that which we have not proved yet. <clears throat> ah. When reality meets imagination. The eternal sky of the moment has become the inspiration <clears throat> of the grounded sight. The picture I've kind of chosen for this talk, the wallpaper photo I found, it's, um, you look at it, you see, you, I, I, I pretty much just centered this, and um, the eye is in the middle of that light thing, above the girl's head. 
And for me, the way we experience thoughts is has a sort of similarity, where just from the I thought emerges the world of that I, the world of that psych and thought. There are wonders in, in all languages. On a linguistic level of appreciation, for example, how the, the word for our biological I, like the word I, E-Y-E, -E, and the letter I, where we say I am here, I am there, you know what I mean, all that? So like the I and the I sound the same. It's as if two different concepts have the same sound because our I thought our identity arises from our eyes from how our eyes have in some sense approached and been approached by the way You must serve before you can command. You must serve your inner reality before you can command your inner reality. And similarly, you must serve the outer reality before you can command the outer reality. Pretty much you gotta learn the ropes uh, uh, before you can function properly. You have, to, you have to understand how the system is moving. You have to observe it for a little bit. Observe and then in some sense advance, observe and advance. That means we're evolving from the era of dividing and conquering to observing and advancing. Where there is no filter to the evolution of intelligence. And the only filter is freedom. We, 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 we just like how we need uh, space and air to breathe, We need to find possibilities of active, meaningful engagement with the world. And I playfully say there's only one way to live for life. You need to live for life to live for life. Much blessings and honesty.